Hi, my name is Brett. I'm pastor of this people. It's good to see all of you, but especially our guests. Welcome. Glad to have you here, and thank you for making us your church home for an hour today. And all I can say is, is wow, just wow. Thank you, Grace Covenant, for your service to the community. Outstanding, outstanding. I think at some level, um, you know, I, I don't, I think heaven is a whole lot like here. Now, hear me. I'm not talking about the pain and agony and the difficulty, but I mean, there are no clouds upon which we sit and play harps. I just don't think that. I think it's, it's relationship. I think it's people. I think it's rejoicing over the fact that the lamb died for us and being able to worship him and see him. And, and, and my point is, I think that they are kind of looking on at us and cheering us. Because we're the ones who are in the fight. They've already graduated. We're still down here. And there's a sense in my own soul, I can't prove it, but with Grace Covenant, with you, somebody up there is going, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, today, we're going to have a collaborative sermon again. And I have the privilege of sitting with my dear friend, Pastor Jim Critcher, who has been with this congregation for 17 years now. Came in 2003. He's a prophet. Came from North Carolina, pastoring a church down there called Grace, correct? Grace Covenant. Covenant church. Yeah, we, we were in the same spiritual family, um, just happened to be the same name of the church. And I knew his pastor really well, Pastor Jim LaFoon. And uh, when Pastor Jim LaFoon, who was one of the pastors of that church, left to go be someplace else, Pastor Jim Critcher took over that congregation, and he and I became really good friends. We traded pulpits on a regular basis, and he came to be with me in 2003 to help us build what we've got now. Had he not come, we would not be who we are. He's a real co-laborer with me. And um, I'm not quite sure how apostolic I am. Uh, little a, probably lowercase little a below the line. Um, but I know that I do some things that are a lot like what the apostles were tasked to do in planting churches and sending people and doing missions. And, and uh, generally speaking, whenever they did things well, they had a prophet who was with them, like Paul had Barnabas, and then Paul had Silas. Well, if I am anything like that, and I'm not much, but I try, uh, I at least do have a, a Barnabas or a Silas. He is all that. Uh, he helps me. He helps his congregation. He prays for me. He hears God on our behalf. He gives us direction. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of vision looking, seeing, capturing, and then vision casting to you all. But before I get to the casting part, the seeing part, I run through him to say, am I seeing right? Am I hearing right? Is this sound right? And he gives some definition to it and helps me know exactly what I shouldn't and should say and how I should say it. You don't know how much this man helps us. And I thought I would do a collaborative sermon with him today because the last time he's been able to speak to you, that was back in January, first Sunday of the year. And so it's almost been six months, and you haven't even seen him. That's what COVID has done to us. God have mercy. Deliver us from COVID. And, uh, you know, both of us are in that age bracket where we have to be careful about where we go and when we go to Home Depot at the AARP time, that kind of thing. And so we've had to make sure that he is safe. Now, he's pretty much uh, safe from most things. If he just stays in his house, he lives on a mountain. It's up in Canada someplace, I think the zip code is. He's got to have a passport just to come to church. And I'm playing, but it's a long way away, and it's way up there too. Whole different climate up there. They get snow, we get rain. That's where he lives. And so it's hard to catch anything up there except uh, maybe a cold, but, meaning being cold, not a cold, being cold. Um, but it, it, when he comes down here, we have to be careful. So he hadn't been down here very much. But I wanted him to come and present today. And I wanted to share with you how much he means to me and what he means to this congregation since many of you all haven't seen him in six months. And we're going to talk about the apostolic and the prophetic and then let him give a message. And I'm going to insert whenever I possibly can there. But I cannot commend this man to you enough. I cannot commend his ministry to you to, uh, enough. And uh, I just want you to know how much I appreciate him. And I hope your ears are open to hear what the Holy Spirit is going to say today. The apostolic and the prophetic are things that are foundational to New Testament reality. Ephesians 2.20 says the church is built upon the apostles and the prophets. Now, there's no question that when Paul was writing that, 
I think he was speaking on a bunch of different levels. One, that he was a, a wise master builder and he was building upon what the prophets had said in the Old Testament. But also he had compatriots with him like Barnabas and Silas. And those two with him would then build churches. And so I think he was talking both the foundation of scripture as we know it and the relationship that he had with people with different giftings. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 talks about how there are first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, and then it co goes through a, a list of different giftings. And so prophets are really important to the life of the church. There aren't many that are actually involved in the church. Usually they come and they just deliver their message and they go on about their way. They're not involved in the system of the church or the workings of the church or the pastoring of the church. But Pastor Jim is. And he has helped for the last 17 years build who we are. And so I want to freshly introduce him to you with the affirmation uh, that comes from the pastor of this congregation. Pastor Jim, thank you for being with us today. Appreciate your ministry and all you've been to us and all you will be to us. Here we are in this world. January, February, we, we started a little skirmish with Iran. Ugh. We didn't know what was going to come from that. Then we get into the end of February and people begin to talk about this disease that started in China and made its way out and got all the way here. And we had no idea we'd be here with with this version of, I guess, a very inflamed flu, some kind of virus. Um, and then we have, five weeks ago, the ethnic unrest in our country. Um, I don't know what God is doing. I just don't know. I, I can't figure it all out. I have some ideas, but I, I don't have any, any, any real firm grasp on what, where are we and what are we doing. And so I'm trusting that my prophet is going to help me today. <laughs> Where are we, Pastor Jim? What is God saying to you? You're about to be deeply disappointed. <laughs> <clears throat> because I'm not sure that anybody has a complete picture of exactly uh, what God is doing and saying in this moment. Um, except I do want to comment on the fact that I heard very clearly uh, the admonition that you call me both old and cold in starting this morning. And so <clears throat> let me just say beware bears. But... Um, <laughs> But I, I, I do have some thoughts, and as you mentioned, the last time that I was here and I spoke to this congregation, and before everything shut down, I, I spoke this same message in a number of different places. And uh, if you remember, the name of that message was Out of Season, and that we were getting ready to come into one of the, a, a tremendous out of season moment where the church would become into its greatest days in season. And I believe that has truly happened. It sure has. And um, I, I'll, I'll make some references to that as, as I, I go through my notes here in just a moment. But um, I, I hold out a lot of hope. I have been so excited to watch the church be the church. Mm, mm. I mean, even taking away the privilege of assembly that we have all took for granted. Um, of the privilege of being together, I still watch the church, particularly this local church and the efforts by Corey and those, others, uh, those other folk. They have just been stellar. We've done more outside of the uh, six acres of this property than I can remember in my 17 years of being here. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we haven't always had uh, impact and input and we've served the community, but not like this. Mm -hmm. And this moment, I believe, has really been an in-season catalyst, if you wish. And through all of the pain and all of the disruption that's happened, uh, I, I just, I'm just one of these guys that has to believe that God is somehow in control of all this. And so uh, let me just say, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be a part for mm -hmm. 17 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tremendous privilege. And, um, uh, but, you know, in the midst of this, there, there's some realities, and you're on the phone uh, constantly talking to people up and down, government and leaders, et cetera, and so forth, and I have one or two calls a week myself, and so, uh, but you and I are hearing some themes, not only of those who are in this congregation, but those with whom we interact. We're hearing folks talk about they're tired. Mm. It's like, I, I don't feel like I'm doing more, but whatever I'm doing, I'm, I'm exhausted, I think many of us, we, we fall, in, we fall into, into the bed at night yeah. 
and, and we're just emotionally and we're spiritually drained. And if, if we're, we're, we're tired. We're, we, we feel stuck. I mean, we feel like we were about to kind of navigate a little bit out of the COVID-19 and the numbers were doing the right thing. And now over this past week, it seems like we're, we're kind of going in the wrong direction again. Um, we, feel, we feel stuck. And then as Christians, we can't use the word fearful because we know that's not yeah. a, a word we can use. But we'll use a euphemism. euphemism. We'll call it apprehensive <laughs> because we're still unsure and unaware uh, really of what, where's all this going? How does all this play through? And, you know, whether it's COVID or the wounds that just don't seem to heal in our nation, we all have these emotions that we're navigating in this particular moment. Um, but I know this, I know that we have a good shepherd who promises mm. two things. Number one, he promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. Matthew 28. He didn't just give us a, a great command and a great commission, but he gave us the very catalyst of what makes it all work. And yeah. that was his abiding presence with us. So one, I know that he will never leave us. But secondly, I know he will never lead us mm. in a place that doesn't involve two things, provision and safety. Mm. That's the promise of Psalm 23. And that's what shepherds do. They lead us into these places. And yet, many times that leadership, we, we're, we're not quite sure because we don't see it all. And God doesn't just lead us out of something. He always leads us into something. I mean, I, I, we, we love that God has rescued us. As Paul wrote from this body of sin and death. I mean, he's, but it's not just that we've been rescued out of something. We have been delivered into something. It's beautiful. And I think that most often we're just happy to be out of it. I'm just happy that I got my ticket punched. I'm not going to hell. I'm, yeah. I'm happy that I'm out of danger, whatever. And, but we need to begin to look not just as getting out of something, but into something. Pastor Jim, I have... I've been walking with Jesus for 40 years, and I don't know that I've ever felt more close to him than I am now. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's not because he's been closer. It, it's that I found doorways to get to him faster than I ever have before. I mean, I'm running through them. I'm not walking through them. I forget, you know, because, because meeting, uh, doing Sundays and leadership groups and different things whereby you get to really be with people you don't you don't realize how much affirmation you receive from just people being around you how much they water you as you water them until they're not there and now you are just watering a camera and you don't have any water back and you're thinking wow I wonder if anybody's listening to anything I got to say I wonder if it's if it's having any impact, you don't know. And so you walk away from these things more tired, less refreshed than you normally would because you don't have the input back. It's true. And so I've had to run to God and say, God, was that okay? <laughs> was that, you like that today? He's the only one that can give me the affirmation I need. And not just in how I'm performing, it's how I'm doing. Yeah. Just getting up on a regular basis saying, Lord, I need to be with you more than I ever have before. So it's driven me. This moment has driven me into his presence like Absolutely. never. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so what we find is God leading us into, into things, into, into greener pastures, into inheritance. But the, there are these crossings as we get from one place to the next. Mm. We find this amazing passage in 2 Corinthians 2. It says that God always leads us. And that word always to me is very important. He leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. Mm. The in Christ is critical here. And through us, and that us, of course, is us, it's the church. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. And so in that is both the promise of his presence, it's the promise of, uh, of, of him leading us into victory, into something that's, that's good, never bad, and yet... In the process of that, there's an aroma mm. that comes from us. It mm. comes from, if you wish, the church 
allowing God to be God in our midst. And so I want to just talk about this concept of crossings because throughout Scripture, we find God leading his people, if you wish, into the impossible. And in that, taking them through impossible crossings to get to the impossible. Hmm. So that he can absolutely say at the end that we will never say, well, we stepped up to this, this, this ocean, this, this sea, and we made it part. Hmm. By our own grand design, our own will, because there was this tremendous need. Watch this. <laughs> never happened. And somehow God will always lead us into these moments where we get so jammed up, it gets so impossible, we break it so, ba- so badly. Mm. You know, I look at the things that are facing our nation right now and realize we can't fix it. No. We can do our part, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but the reality is it's broken to the extent that only God can fix it. And so let me talk a minute about crossings, if I could, because while we see the probably the greatest example that uh, that's even those that are not even in the church have heard the story of Israel crossing on dry ground through the Red Sea, four centuries of bondage, leading them out of something. But we see a second crossing involving water that comes of four decades of wandering prerequisite to four decades of wandering in the wilderness of coming up to the Jordan River. And you and I and our wives and a a great group of folk were actually at the Jordan River Mm. back in February. Thank goodness it was February and not April. We had that trip planned. And we've had the privilege of going to Israel for the past couple of years. And the first year we went, the Jordan was this sort of lazy, little, dirty, Mm. muddy, kind of ditchy looking thing. But when we went back this last year, it was a different body of Very water. Different. I mean, it was moving fast. I mean, it was right at the point wow. of overflowing its banks. And one of the, I think one of the sentiment we all had is, I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Much less get yeah. in it. Yeah. And yet, this is, once again, God saying, this is, this is how I'm going to take you over. Hmm. And so we know this story over in Joshua 3. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't tell the story, but... You know, after all of this time, again, 400 years of of bondage, 40 years in the wilderness, we're now ready to enter promise. And we're we're here, we're at the banks of the Jordan. And once again, we we see this story. It says that the the, the Jordan is at flood tide during harvest. Now, the connection between those two things is certainly Mm. very intentional from Mm. Scripture. And the application for that for us right now is certainly very rich. And yet, we find another situation where there had to be a crossing through a very inopportune moment. And so, I want to talk for a moment about as we are being led by God... And whether it's navigating COVID, whether it's the economic challenges, whether it is, it is the things facing our nation as it regards reconciliation. The question for us always has to begin, what is God doing? Where is he leading us? How and when? Because these are the questions. These are the questions that, that you asked me in the mm-hmm. beginning. And so the first question uh, is, is, a, is, it's a, It's a question of coordinates. Where are we going? Where are we going? You know, and often we just want to be anywhere but here. Hmm. Anywhere but here. I mean, any, we get jammed up and it's like anything must be better than this. Hmm. All right. And what we do many times, we build these little utopian worlds in our head. This is what it should look like. This is what my life should be. And if God really loved me, he would come and build according to my design. Mm. And he would would allow this to come into place and come into play. Henry Blackaby years ago wrote a book. And the book could be summed up in one phrase. Find out what God is doing and go do it with him. Well, sort of the flip side of that same coin is find out where God is going Mm. and go with him. 
And I think that becomes critical for any crossing. We've got to figure out where is God in this? Where, where is God going? Where is, where is God leading us? And that always brings us into a question of kingdom realities. Because if we're just looking to just cross over into something, either of our imagination or even something man-made, it's always going to be flawed by the very nature that flawed mankind made it. Hmm. And so it's only as we come into kingdom realities that we are, we are building. We, we, we were taught by Jesus himself to pray, thy kingdom come. That, that becomes the picture, the model. When you find over in Hebrews, even, even Abram, when God told him to, as an old man, pick up, leave. Where am I going? You, I'll let you know when you get there. Kind of like the kids in the back seat. Are we there yet? <laughs> I'll let you know when we get there. But this is, this is an old guy. And yet he didn't, know, he didn't even know what he was looking for. Mm. But he did know this much. It says in Hebrews 11, looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Mm. And I got to tell you, Pastor, I am not looking for a better version of what we have. I'm looking for something that God is uniquely constructing. Good. That we can step back and say, couldn't do it. Couldn't have conceived it. Couldn't have changed the hearts. Couldn't have moved the legislation. Couldn't have done the... Wow. I, 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 want, I want to be in a place where we can really see God's kingdom come in every one of these areas. Whether it's how COVID gets eradicated off this planet, mm. whether it's the tensions in our nation or the things that are facing the nations right now, that we all can look back and we can marvel and wonder, wow. And it's, it's interesting. Abraham came into the promised land, then Abram came into the promised land, but he did not have to cross the Jordan. There were other ways to get to the promised land. That's right. Other than crossing the Jordan. In fact, Israel had to go on the other side of the Jordan to get in. They had to go north, then east, and then back west to get in. And it seems that God wants us to encounter, or I'll say it this way, it seems that God wants us to encounter him in miraculous ways by uh, he allowing us the privilege of coming through things so we can see his power displayed in our life so that we can overcome the things that we have to later on. Yes. We can use this as a testimony. This river moment that they were about to experience at the Jordan, the impossible impossible, I mean, it was already a river, but now it's a flood stage, All right? And you had about two and a half to four million people, two million men probably, four million altogether, not to mention cattle and sheep and donkeys, trying to get over. How in the world were they going to cross? Lord, why did you take us to this spot? Couldn't we have gone around another spot? The Lord wanted to do something really spectacular here so that they would see this is the God who you get to serve, and this is the God who will protect you. And if I did this, if I removed this obstacle for you, watch what I will do when you get into my promised land. Absolutely. So the, the obstacles, the difficulty that we face, no fun. I would have scripted it differently. But God is about to do something really special. And the conditions, as, as you mentioned, the conditions by which um, most often God will orchestrate conditions in such a way mm. that it becomes impossible for man, that what is impossible for man is just easy with yes, and for God. Yes, it is. And yet... One of the things that, that I mentioned at the beginning of this year were, as we talked about out of season, where that opposition would become opportunity. Hmm. And opportunity for us, yes, but an opportunity for God to make himself known. And that river at flood stage, again, especially dangerous. I mean, and, and there are things that happen when water gets in turmoil like that. Hmm. I mean, there are currents that we don't even see. Yeah. And there are, there, 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 there are currents, there are undertoes that happen that if we're not careful, will try to pull us down and pull us under and drown us in moments like this. Mm. You and I spoke about this briefly in your office prior to, to this moment. But I would say that there is, if you wish, there is a, um, there is a demonic undertow that's trying to pull people under right now. And, you know, one of the things about an undertow is you can't humanly outswim one. 
If you do, you'll exhaust yourself and you'll die. You have to run parallel. You have to swim parallel to an undertow because hmm. you can't outswim one. You know, Ezekiel 47, there was a divine river, if you remember, that yeah. it originated from the throne. Yeah. It was a divine river. But it said that no man could cross it hmm. and no man could swim in it. And so there's something about this moment uh, that the conditions that God has set up whereby which we have to figure out how do we cooperate. Good. The first thing is we have to be a prophetic people. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Two young men, Joshua and Caleb, that sort of set this whole thing up. Going back into the book of Numbers chapter 11, and they go over with 10 other spies. And the 10 spies, as you know, they bring this bad report back. These guys are huge. It's great land, but we, no way, not going to happen. Joshua and Caleb said, we should do this. Now, it's interesting that all 12 spies were seeing the same thing through their natural eye gates. But Joshua and Caleb were seeing something by the Spirit. Yeah. God was inspiring them to see the opportunity in the midst of the opposition. Hmm. And, as you, and as you remember, the 10 with a bad report, they died of a plague. Yeah. We'll just move on quick. <laughs> <laughs> but the two, they were not only able to be catalysts for this moment, but they were the ones that, the only ones that were able to inherit. Mm. Our ability to see correctly is directly connected to our ability to be able to inherit later. Mm. So as a prophetic people, the church, we have to be those eyes. We have to be those ears of constantly pointing people to the right coordinates. This is what God is doing. This is what God is saying. And we've got to, again, we've got to be prophetic. Mm. We've got to be priestly. I mean, part of this story that's so remarkable is the priest there standing on that, standing on the ground while the miles away this river rolls up. But that was not, we, we kind of blip over it pretty quickly in Scripture, but they were standing there a long time. I mean, this was new territory for the priests. They'd not done this before. You, you mean you want us to... Carrying the ark, you want us to step on this river and something's going to happen? Yes, what I said. And so they have to stand there for hours. I mean, how long does it take to get a few million people and all their four-legged friends across? I mean, and can you imagine, I mean, the same way that Israel is going through the Red Sea and they're looking around, it's like they got mad Egyptians at the back, they got drowning to the left and to the right, and they've got the unknown in front of them. I mean, here we're going into this river. The priests are standing there. Don't you know these guys were like, what do you think about this? I don't know, man. <laughs> I wish there were another way. Because I'm, I'm tired. I don't know when this water is coming back down this river. And when the priests, see, see Joshua was given a command by God that the priests should carry the Ark of the Covenant into the River Jordan. And once the feet of the priests touched the river, the river would stop. And so there were four priests because there were four corners of the tabernacle, excuse me, of the Ark of the Covenant, and they had rings on four corners, and there were poles that went through the four rings. And one priest would stand on each corner, holding the Ark between them. Now, when the, when the water stopped, God didn't say where it was going to stop. It actually stopped 11 miles upstream. Now, the water that was the River Jordan at this time, flowed so broadly because it was, it was snow melt from the mountains. So you're talking about waters that someplace in the neighborhood of 45, 50 degrees? That's cold. That's turned your feet blue cold. The priests step into the river and they're looking at one another saying, I thought Joshua said the water was going to stop. I don't see it stopping. It's not stopping. It's not stopping. Sometimes we have to stand in the midst of very cold. I don't know wh where the phrase came from, he got cold feet, but this might be it. <laughs> we have to stand in the midst of adversity longer than we want to in order for other people to cross over. And God's not telling us where the water's stopping. He's just saying it is. And it was 11 miles upstream. If the river is flowing three miles an hour, which is a pretty good clip, 
you're talking about these guys having to stand in the river for three or four hours until they see the water stop. And that's tough. And immediately they had to begin to, to talk to one another, say, I, it, it doesn't seem to be working. It doesn't seem to be working. And sure enough, it was. They just couldn't see it. We're standing for our community right now. We just can't see the results. The go. water is stopped 11 miles upstream. We just don't know it yet. And the, the temptation, the undertow is get out of the water. Dangerous. Get out of the water. Listen, it's too tough. It's not going to happen. The word of the Lord isn't true. You get all these things in your brain that are contrary to what God told you to do and, and, and make you feel more comfortable, but don't allow the will of God to be that which is effective for everybody else. And we need to stand in the midst of these difficulties, even though we don't see what we want to see when we want to see it. Perfect. And so here we have a moment where Pastor Jim is talking about that we need to be priests. And we need to be faithful and we need to stand on this word and believe that God has said what he is going to. He said what he said and he's going to do what he said. And there's a participation and that's the third P. Can't have a good sermon unless you've got three P's. <laughs> but prophetic, priestly, but there's a participation that the prophetic and the priestly can point the way, but we still have to walk through it. Mm. You see. And giving orders to the people, it said here in verse 3, when you see the Ark of the Covenant and the priests. So the Ark representing the presence of God and the priests, then you are to move from your positions and follow. Mm. And to me, that becomes a twofold mission of the church in this moment is that we are to be ark bearers and presence carriers. Mm. That people can see something in and on the church that we're prophetic people. The presence of God is with us. The same way that Moses prayed, he said, God, unless you go with us, what will distinguish us from the other peoples on the earth? That one, it's the ark of the presence. In this case, yeah. the abiding spirit among God's people. But secondly, that we are fulfilling our priestly functions as his church. Mm -hmm. Then I believe there can be a participation as people see these things working in tandem. Mm -mm -mm. And it's never going to be easy. That's my last point. It's always a cost. Yeah. yeah. There's always a cost. And now we know that this cost was ultimately paid by Jesus himself. We... we we, but we have to state that categorically right out of the box. I mean, Hebrews 9, it says that he didn't enter by the blood of goats and calves, but by the most holy place, what? Once and for all by his own blood. I mean, he, he, he came, talk about, talk about the ultimate crossing. Mm. It was the crossing of the glories of heaven seated by the right hand of the Father to come and take on... The, Humanity yeah. and all that that entailed. I mean, he made that first crossing for us. Mm. Phenomenal. But we also see in that cost, he became a great high priest. He went first, Hebrews. He's granted us access once again. Uh, Romans 5, Ephesians 2. But yet there's still costs to be paid by yeah. us. Now, these costs, of course, are always... In, in, in contrast to that great cost that, that Jesus paid. Matthew 16, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses for my sake. Now that word is important right there. Is if there's a cost to be paid where a life is lost, we need to be sure that I think the exchange is being made correctly. Mm -hmm. For my sake. He goes on a few chapters later in Matthew and he says that anyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father or mother or children or feels, here is that word again, for my sake. Mm. He promises a return a hundredfold. Now we don't, this is not some divine investment account. But I think that what struck me in looking at these crossings is that a crossings with no cross is probably not a divine crossing. Mm. There has to be a cross involved. First of all, there's got to be a cross that we know Jesus. 
has orchestrated this. But secondly, a willingness that we, whatever, whatever the cost is that's being exacted upon us in the moment, that we're willing to pick that cross up for his sake. That's beautiful. Beautiful. So, Pastor, I don't think I answered any of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe, uh, maybe prophetically, pastorally, at least to maybe put up some road signs to help us safely get from where we are to where we're being led. Well, I think, I think he gave us a good idea prophetically about how to do that. And I don't want anybody to get the impression that if somehow you don't have the faith that Caleb and Joshua had, you're going to wind up like the other ten spies that <laughs> found themselves in a <laughs> difficult spot with a plague and then somehow relate that specifically to what's going on in our world. Not true. But I do want us to all be encouraged with the idea that because we are the church, we need to think differently about obstacles that are in front of us, that are trying to stop us from getting where we need to be. The obstacles of the disease that is ravaging the world and us trying to still do congregation, us trying to still do family, us trying to still do outreach to the community, we trying to be relevant to every environment. It's harder this way. I'm having to upgrade my Wi-Fi in my home because I click off all the time on my computer. That's a little frustrating when you're leading, trying to figure out how to do a Zoom call with 50 people, and you're talking, and the, then you're not. Well, that's because you have 50 people in your I home got a bunch always of, trying to get oh on at the same gosh, time. It's just every, and they're, they're playing <laughs> video games because they're out of work. <laughs> so my point is this. You know, we're trying to do church differently and it's not easy doing it like this and everything on the inside of me wants to figure out how in the world we can hurry up and meet but I can't do that because this virus is changing the way everything I think about how we need to be and you you sit there and say well am I going to give in to the pressures that everybody else is giving into and, and let fear and worry and concern and issues over finances and whether people are with us or not because you don't know I mean we get the stats of how many people are are logging on but we don't know it could be a yoga class and we're the background music I don't know we we really want to have an impact and I know that when people are in the congregation on a Sunday morning before COVID and whenever we get past this they're not doing yoga while I'm preaching I know that but I don't know what's going on right now and so it's bugging my mind and so I've got to exert my faith on a regular basis to believe that God is caring for his church and helping his people even though I don't have the same wineskin I used to. Mm. Even though I don't still, I don't have the same affirmations that things are going well, God is Lord of his church. I've got to tell myself that. And regardless of the giants that I see that are getting bigger and bigger every time I think they need to be minimized or they're getting smaller, I have to trust my God is well able to give us the land, even though we are not used to doing church like this. Now, I'm only talking about church. I'm not talking about life. I'm not talking about outreach. I'm just talking about this one thing. There are so many other fronts that I must concern myself with that look like they are giants and I don't know how to overcome them, except to get up and serve my God well every day and trust beyond that which I see. So even though there may not be a corresponding plague, that comes with somebody's doubt and unbelief in this environment. I still am required to believe that God is well able to give us the promised land if he is pleased with us. And that's what we have to do every day is make sure he is happy with us. And when we lay our head on the pillow at night, we have the confidence that we brought a smile to the face of our God. Every day, every day, every day. And if you're challenged on how to do that, meaning you might be stuck at home. You don't even see anybody but your own people, your family. And they've enjoyed about as much of you as they can stand. You're trying to figure out how in the world to be relevant. Ask the Holy Spirit what you need to do for your neighbors. There are ways, creative ways that he will give you to be Jesus to people who desperately need hope in this time. And I don't know that it's going to get much better quicker. I don't know. I thought it was, but my thoughts have been pretty much dashed against the rocks. I'm not quite sure what a new reality looks like for us. I don't know, but I know this, that my God is on the throne. He hasn't been moved. 
And he's still moving in extraordinary ways yes. through the lives of his people who will believe him to move through their lives. And I'm finding new ways of doing ministry, ways that I really wasn't happy about or thinking about doing, but I'm finding great solace in the fact that I'm still being able to touch people and help folk and transform lives through his word. He's doing stuff. And lastly, please do not judge everything about what God is doing regarding what he's doing through you. He's bringing a plow through this world. And what, what is a plow for? It's not just to turn over dirt because a farmer doesn't have anything to do. Pastor Jim talked about a plow. The, uh, the last meeting we had where we could do actual congregational thing, we had a leadership meeting in March. I think it was the 14th. This is the 16th Sunday. Yes, I'm counting. March 14th, Pastor Jim got up and prophesied at this leadership meeting, and he said, uh, God's taken a plow through the nations. Okay? Why does a farmer take a plow into the earth? Except to plant. That's right. That's the only reason he does it, is to plant. So if God's taken a plow into the heart of the nations, our job as the church is to go behind and drop seed. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, <laughs> I don't know any other way to describe what I'm about to say except how I'm going to say it. I'm dropping seed in places, and it's like Jack and the Beanstalk seed. I don't even know how to describe it, Pastor Jim. I just throw it out the window. The next morning, it's a beanstalk that's 1,000 feet tall. I, 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 and I'm not doing anything different. It's just that the... The circumstances of this world have proven to be pretty good fertilizer. <laughs> people's hearts are open. They're hearing things differently. I don't know how else to describe it, but people are just saying, please help me, Pastor. I don't know what to do. Folks who weren't calling for me four months ago are now calling. Ears are open to hear things like never before. I just want you to know that when God brings the plow through, he's expecting you to follow. We are the sowers. He's the plower. Bring your seed to your community. Bring your seed to your Costco. Bring your seed wherever you go and put it in the earth and watch what God will do with your kindness and your goodness and all the things that are related to the sharing of this gospel. I want to give you hope. We're not done. We're just, get, just getting started. And pastor in, in Ecclesiastes 11, the passage that I preached out of in January, he said, sow your seed. Mm -mm -mm. Sow your seed in the morning, for you don't know how it might succeed. Mm. You know, I, I look at you, and I know how faithful you've been over the years to sow in so many different arenas. But you're sowing the same seed you've always sown. Same seed, no different. They're, they're good seed. They're gospel seed. Gospel seed. And yet God himself has changed the environment. Yes, he has. That now all of a sudden the humidity is perfect, the temperature is perfect, mm. the pH is mm. perfect. Everything is perfect that those seed now can have that effect. Yeah, and I, 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 there's no way I can exaggerate what I'm saying. It's like Jack and the Beanstalk for me. Seeds are growing so quickly. I've been able to do it an hour and a half on a Zoom call with organizations. More in an hour and a half than I've been able to do in 20 years. No exaggeration. I want you to know the environment is ripe. Mm. Do what you need to do. Stand in the river and don't get out until people cross. Not just you cross. People who are coming after you cross. And watch what God will do for our community. Let's yeah. pray.